Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. It's humid out. I was, it's more humid out than I thought it was and I'm just kind of dying of heat here. But anyways, that's okay. Um, thank you for coming out. Um, this is a nice turn out this afternoon. So, uh, and I think we'll hear some very interesting information. A uh, couple housekeeping things, of course, before we get started. Um, tea and coffee, water on the side there, as well as some treats. Uh, washrooms, uh, if you haven't been here before, are just down the hall here uh, to the left. If you have a cell phone, if you could please put it on silent or vibrate, uh, that would be helpful just so that um, it reduces distraction during our presentation. So that would be wonderful. Uh, a couple things, um, just upcoming events uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, on Thursday, so at the, la the last week of August, um, you may or may not know the Canadian Plowing Match uh, will be held here on Wolf Island as well as the Wolf Island Plowing Match. Um, we have um, been asked to be part of a special event on Thursday, August the 29th in the evening from 4 till 8. Uh, it's called A Night in the Village. And so uh, some of our local stores, uh, the churches will be open. We're going to have the museum open um, for people to come in and have a look and wander around. Uh, and check things out because sometimes after hours or on weekends some of those places aren't open and uh, this gives everybody an opportunity to come and browse and, and enjoy themselves. So um, that is there uh, on the 29th, like I said, from 4 till 8. Um, there will also be horse-drawn uh, carriage rides that are going to be going around and we will be taking part uh, in that as well. So um, giving a bit of a historical tour. So if you are here uh, and looking for something to do that evening, please feel free to come over and join us. Uh, on Sunday, September the 8th, starting at 1.30, uh, is our next speaker event. Um, so we will be having uh, Kathy Christie. She is a Master Gardener and Chair of Cassie, which is the Kingston Area Seed uh, System Initiative. And she's going to be coming and doing a presentation called Every Seed Has a Story. And uh, the presentation, uh, she'll be taking us back um, in time to explore where some of our favorite foods originated from, how they moved from around the world, and uh, the importance of growing and saving them. So um, it's going to be a really, really interesting presentation about um, heirloom gardening. And that will be the last uh, scheduled speaker event that we have for this season. So um, if you're available, please feel free to join us here. Um, also on Sunday, September the 22nd, starting at 1.30, we will be uh, having our annual general meeting. It will be held virtually this year. Um, and so if you are interested in attending, please speak to one of us. Um, I, anybody who's a member, I have sent out my last little email blast about how you can, uh, you need to register to be able to attend. So you need to contact Sheila. She is the person to, that will be uh, keeping track of our registrations. So if you're interested in attending, uh, please let us know because we will be sending you information related to um, the meeting prior to. So um, feel free, like I said, to, to speak to one of us while you're here or to email us and we can give the information to Sheila or speak to Sheila directly. Okay. So this afternoon, uh, we have the pleasure of talking about genealogy. Um, and tracing back some of our family roots and that. So we have with us here this afternoon, we have uh, Nancy Cutway and Paul Woodrow here from the Kingston branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society. Um, and they're going to share with us how to research where our families came from, find details about them, explain the basic types of documentation to research and where to find that, as well as some other tips and tricks. So please, um, Help me welcome Nancy and Paul. Thank you, Shauna. And thank you all for coming. And I guess I better, my arm is not as long as I thought for reaching to the mouse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can do it now? Sure. So Paul's going to give you a, all a bit of a handout. And we're, you know, let's keep this very informal. If you have questions, ask as you they occur to you. Don't wait till the end. I, I'm not a professor standing up 
of the, telling the class to wait. Um, one thing, when you're starting genealogy, you sort of have to think about what you might want to accomplish. I hope that went, yeah. And I'm not blocking the, the view. Good. That's why I'm sitting. Um, people, some people just want to get the sort of birth, marriage, death dates of their ancestors and call it quits. But once you get into it, and it, it hooks you, and you want to find out more about the people, you know, like, well, how did they meet their partner? Why did they decide to emigrate from that wonderful life with rocky fields in Scotland to rocky fields in Ontario? So, you know, what, what did, why did they do this? Now, we'll give you a bit of terminology first. Some years ago, I heard a, I think it was, it was on CBC, it could have been CTV, a TV announcer talking about some individual and saying, and his descendants came during the Irish potato famine. And I thought, no, because he's much younger than those people. They were his ancestors. So, and it seems to be a, something that confuses people early on when they're starting genealogy. So I just say, ancestors come from above you in the tree. They're the people that, that came before you in time. And descendants are your children and grandchildren. So now you already are all much smarter than that TV newscaster. So you know that. So we work with a couple basic concepts and forms. And in, in your handout, you'll find we've given you a blank pedigree chart. You have to fill it in, unlike this one that's filled in. But pedigree chart is just your direct line. So your two parents, your four grandparents, your eight great-grandparents. And the other form we use a lot is a family group sheet to sort of co collect the information about a particular family, father, mother, and children. And you, you, to, if you're just starting to do genealogy, you want to talk to all your living relatives and get information about them. And, and hopefully not just their dates of birth and marriage, but a little bit of background about their life and what do they remember and what was the most interesting thing their Aunt Matilda told them and, and get some notes like that. And as a starting point, you can give each family a, a blank group sheet to fill in their facts and give it back to you if they will. And the, you would just start to fill it out like this with the information that you know about a person and you're not going to know it all, but you collect it gradually. But the thing is, if you're doing it on a piece of paper, it can be a bit tiresome because you're having to get back to that piece of paper. So what we always suggest is that people start right from the beginning with a genealogy software program, a record program. And then you only have to enter, you know, I would only have to put Sheila Canyon once as a name, and I don't have to type her name again on other forms or other sheets. So if you start recording right from the beginning, uh, you can add to the record later, obviously, and, and change things if you find that, no, you got the date wrong because it wasn't October 5th that they were born, it was May 10th, and the person had reversed the 5 and 10, and I'll, I'll talk about dates in a minute too. Or if you find you want to switch programs later, all the genealogy software programs that I know of have a means of exchanging the in, their information, so you put it into what they call a GEDCOM format and ship it to the other program, and you don't have to retype everything you've laboriously entered in. I, I think over the years I've gone through four different software programs that I, and I just migrated the information each time. And programs also have lots of report forms, so you can ask it to give you a report of, I don't know, I really don't, can't think of something offhand, but you'll see the gaps in your information. But if you ask it for a list of 
people, even if you just look at the, at it, the list it has of birth and death, and you'll say, well, okay, I've got that person's birth, but I don't know what they where they died, but since they were born in 1856, I don't think they're still alive, so I should be able to find a death, maybe. And software allows you to in incorporate the sources of each piece of information, because it's very important, as Paul reminded me, that we should say sources are almost the most important thing to collect, because if you put down the George and Mary were married in 1943. Where did you get that piece of information? Was that just somebody telling you? Or was it from a an actual rec register that you saw an image of? Because so much is being digitized now and on the web. You can see the images. So you want to track the source so you can go back to it. And, and also so you don't go and research that source or that date again. That's Which right. Done yes. Cheaply. Yes. And it even your standard your citation can be more formal or it can just say interview with great aunt Mary Jones. It, and it probably personal information it is important to note that it always came from a person's hearsay or memory or so that if you later on find something that contradicts it, you'll know why it contradicts it, because Great Aunt Mary was a little forgetful of the facts. And also, I have found that every family story that comes down gets a bit changed each generation, so it's important to note the sources. So this is an example of a marriage record from the database at Ancestry, which has an all the Ontario birth, marriage, death registrations that are available for, to the public. And so uh, you would see there's three marriages in the format they used. So there's the three vertical ones. And Ancestry give you, uh, they've extracted the information. And what you don't really see is that other names in, on their extraction are links also. So if I wanted to then click on the mother and see what records they had on Louisa Compton, I could click there and move around and look for records. But you, that's all under detail. If I wanted to find out what the site, what I should cite, I could click on the source tab there and it gives me what the citation is and I can just copy that and put it in my record program so I don't have to retype. I'm a great believer in retyping as little as possible. Because when you retype you make mistakes too. And I'll go back into a record for a person if, and I'll see the typos I've made and I think why didn't I see that before? So copying is better. Now this for this, if I looked at the same record on the Family Search site, which is the Mormon Church, and they have pretty well all the same, similar information, not always the same, and and I would have their citation, and, and again I would copy their citation to my record keeping. So, the one program I both Paul and I use is Legacy Family Tree software. They've just, after many years, upgraded to a version 10. And I hope you can see the word there, free. Download, maybe not, maybe it's too, not big enough, but it's, they've decided to make it free to everybody. And I think free is a great way to start out with and try the software Try using it. You're you're not out any money, and if you later on decide to go for another, a different program, you haven't. You don't have to retype. You just export your data from the legacy to the other. Now this is what the screen would look like when you're working inside it. This is my second great uncle and his wife and their children and his parents listed. And the, so that's some of the features. It tells you the relationship 
well, to whoever you set it to tell you the relationship to. But for me, I want to know how, how the people I'm adding are related to me so I can, I am set as the person to compare with. But you, it also is, a, is very handy. You can, if I find a third cousin and she said, but am I the same relationship to so-and-so? Well, I can set her and compare them to her. Another feature you would notice is that the girls' names are in red and the boys are in blue. I realize this is sort of sexist, old-fashioned pink and blue, but it, it helps, obviously, to know whether you were talking a daughter or a son. It lets you put in all the information you have about them. It, and I'll show you in, in, in a second, you, there's a lot more information you can add to. And all the little icons under the person's name um, are for various things like their brothers and sisters. So they're quick ways to get to that. Now, all the dates you'll notice are the day, the month written in letters, in three letters, and then the year. Because when the, the Mormon church started their members doing genealogy early on and realized people were getting confused between 5th of the 10th or 10th of the 5th. And they suggested, and everybody has adopted as a standard, that you, for the month, you put it in words, so there's no doubt. I mean, obviously, if the day is, is 20th or 18th, there wouldn't be much doubt anyway, because we don't have, tw have 18 months. But for the 10th of May or the 5th of October, you wouldn't know which is which. So, And the nice thing is, if I were to enter a date, and if I was entering something today and put in August 18, it would change it. Once I've entered that, it would change it to 10 Aug and the, the year. So it, it uh, helps keep track of your dates very nicely. So this is f the information for an individual. And as you can see, there's some events and facts other than the dates up at the top. And you can, for some people, I've got lots of information. I've got census records, directory entries, lots. And for some, I don't. But that's the way it is. And the words born, died, and buried are in red beside the dates for them because that shows I've also entered a source for that fact. So if I want to know at a glance whether I've put in a source, I can tell if it's turned red or not. But there are other options for software. Uh, Family Tree Maker. The, the one drawback to Legacy is it doesn't have a Mac version. So for people who our Mac users, they would, would have to get what, from another brand, Family Tree Maker or Roots Magic, or a, a Reunion is for Mac only. But as I say, they, you, they're inter, you can interchange the, in, the data between them. Um, online trees, uh, people, Family Search encourages everybody to put their, in, their trees online on their site. But the tree is not locked on the family search site. So anybody can come along and say, oh, we share that great grandfather, but you've got the wrong date. I'm going to change that. And they can change your information on their site. And Ancestry lets you put up your tree, unless you're using just the Ancestry Library Edition. And I don't know if you're, I don't know if the Wolf Island branch of the library lets you use it here or if you have to go into one of the, the ones in town like the Central or Isabel Turner but there is a version of an the Ancestry software and you can use for free at the library but 
you can't put up a tree if you're using just that version. Oh yeah, the ancestry, you can do all the, and again, I don't know if it lets you search every ancestry database, but I know people go into Central Branch and use it on their computers there. And I, it, you might be able to use it now at the Wolf Island Branch too. So, so what I think most of us who've been doing genealogy a long time recommend as best practice is to collect your information in a program on your own computer. And then if you want to put a tree on family tree, or if you want to put a tree on ancestry, or if you have your DNA done and you want to put it on the DNA site, you can ex output to a, jet, a GEDCOM of your tree and post it there. But then all the other information that you've collected about the family, like the, the stories that are tied to your records, is on your computer and you, you control it. So it's not going to be on a website that is somewhere else. Because you can control how much you put into a tree that you send to Family Tree Maker. Uh, no, F FTDNA, Family Tree DNA. Is like, there, are, there need to be more words for some of these companies because they all sound similar. <clears throat> So what sort of records can you use to find out about your family? Well, there's probably as many things as you could think of. So my, the list I have here is just a starting point. And a lot of them are now being digitized and made available through websites, some for free, some for payment. <clears throat> You know, you can, if your grandparents, great-grandparents, whoever came from someplace into Canada <coughs> by ship after 18, 1865, I think the immigration list started, you can see the passenger list. So you can see what they said about where they were coming from and often it says that they're going it asked why they were coming or where they're going w once they've landed going going to sister in winnipeg or going to brother in toronto so you'll get some more family information just that way newspapers <coughs> pardon me <coughs> Talking too much already. <coughs> Ian, I'm sorry to be talking and coughing into your mic. <coughs> Newspapers can be a, a vast source of information. <coughs> because a hundred years ago, even, if you had your aunt and uncle come from Montreal to visit for a week, that usually got into the paper. So then you, if you didn't know the married name of the aunt, now you're going to have her surname. All sorts of information is available. And they, they do take time to find out what is available and then go through and look for your family members. But it it's... It's the search that's the fun part. The Whig standard is digitized. The older parts, papers that were part of it, well, there's a, a site called Digital Kingston that's off of the uh, Kingston Library site, but if you just Google Digital Kingston, it, you would come up to it. And Depending on the time period you're looking for, it will direct you to a couple of different places. The later papers, right up to probably last year or the year before, are on a 
website called newspapers.com that it has many digitized newspapers now. So you can pretty well find things. Not all papers are, and sometimes um, a local area group will have di digitized the paper, so it'll be on their site. For instance, um, the Huron County Public Libraries digitized all the newspapers from Huron County, and they're all freely available on their library site. So Now, <clears throat> when you get information, either from one of the searches you've done or from maybe you've seen somebody else's tree online that looks like they have the same relatives because they've got Mary Brown marrying John Smith and so do you and about 1862. Well, theirs is 1872, but, you know, it's probably the same person. Well, you don't rush to assume that. And look at their information in particular to see if it passes <clears throat> the, well, the math test for one thing. Do they have, in fact, have somebody getting married at 10? Or do they have somebody having a child at 60? Not likely. So they've skipped a generation in, with the 60-year-old. So <clears throat> be, be cautious about other people's information. But so you'll have to do a little math. You'll have to freshen up your geography awareness because I get I see names of villages I've never heard of. I mean I've lived in Kingston since 1966 and there's still place names I hear of to the north and west that I've never heard of before. And maybe they don't actually exist now, but they did 150 years ago, so somebody refers to that. <clears throat> My husband's aunt was born when the family lived in Florida. What's now the Florida Road was actually a, a village of Florida at one point, or a hamlet. So she used to love telling people she was born in Florida. <laughs> and that would confuse them all to heck, but... <clears throat> and that's another thing that you'll find that there are place duplicate place names even in this wonderful province because for some reason for instance the village of the town of Perth is not in Perth County I learned early on when I was corresponding secretary for our branch that in fact there was originally Camden East and Camden West Camden East we know is just that way. Camden West is down near Windsor, but it dropped the West at some point. So you, it, it can be confusing geography of where people were. <clears throat> and you have to do a little history reading, at least, you know, f Google a timeline or something it, if, if you want to find out what was going on at the same time as a, your family was doing a particular thing like moving or having children or whatever. Of course, that's what happens with me when I look at newspapers. On, on, I'm looking at the newspaper to find a birth record, and then I read the headlines. You know, about President McKinley assassinated, and so I start reading the news of the day instead of what I'm looking for. But spelling doesn't count. All of these people are my family. And I was saying to Ian, because Richard Cawtree or Cawtree or however he might have pronounced it came from Scotland to Quebec. And then the re records might have been written by someone French speaking, but who was hearing a Scottish accent, and so the name gradually morphed and got an L in it. And after about 1850, all the members stayed as Coltree, but they started out as Coftree, maybe. I don't know how you would say it. 
So where do you get information? Well, there are big websites that make it easy because there are so many databases there. And some of them are free. Some of them you have to subscribe to unless you use the Ancestry edition in the library. And some are what are called portals. So Cindy's list of genealogical sites has about well, maybe 400,000 links. I didn't check what she's at today. So if you want to start at looking on a new topic, you suddenly discovered that somebody says they came from Iowa, and you don't know anything about Iowa, so you want to find out about Iowa. If you go to Cindy's list, you can find all the links she has about Iowa, and she will have dozens, if not hundreds. There's also the Ancestor Hunt is a similar collector of links, and Can Genealogy is specifically for Canadian genealogy sites. So it can be helpful to find, because if you want to then get to something more specific, like, okay, I want to look for military records in Canada and dealing with people in the submarine service or something, you want to drill down so they'll help direct you to a, the right website. And now this familysearch.org is the Mormon site. You don't have to be a church member and it's free, but you do have to have an account and log in. It's just sort of the same idea as making sure you're a human and not a robot on, to get into the, the site. Sometimes they only have transcriptions of records, not the actual images. But some, I'm, sometimes if I'm looking for the same record, I'll look at Ancestry and Family Search because their indexing might be better, whoever does the indexing. And one thing about Family Search is they have a, a wiki. We're just like Wikipedia, they have created their own wikis about genealogical topics. And so they have 99,000 articles, probably soon to be 100,000, I would think. So, as I say, I looked to see how many there were with about Wolf Island, and there's 14 entries about Wolf Island on their site. So there's information about everything. And it's always a good idea to read up on something first before you actually search the database, because I don't know about you, Paul, but I've found myself times, why am I not finding the marriage in that database? And then I read the fine print that it had about that it, the record, it may say the records go from 1850 to 1900, but in fact there's a gap at, you know, 1883 to 1886 because that record book burned. Well, if I'd read that ahead of time, I might not have tried looking for the marriage I wanted right then. And Ancestry is the other big uh, site that most people know about because they advertise so much. And the, you can uh, have all sorts of databases there. Library and Archives Canada is free for Canadian material, obviously, and um, they're sort of in mid-process of doing a real big redo of their database, of their website. So sometimes it'll say we're in the process of changing and you change, you've been directed here by this link, but it, you should change to another link or whatever, but they've got everything. So if you, you know, if you want to know about a soldier from World War I, every single soldier's record, full service record, is available. Find My Past is an English site, so if you're interested primarily in English research, it's a good place, to, but you do have to pay a subscription. It's not 
I mean, none of these are hugely expensive, but sometimes it's good. Sometimes they offer bargains, and sometimes they offer free access for, say, well, at the, the time of the coronation of Charles, for about a month, Find My Past was being free to everybody in the world to look for British things because they were celebrating the King's coronation. So you can watch for those too. One interesting th thing they have was that in 1939, everybody in England had to register for ration books and they kept track of those people until well into the, about 1960. So if somebody was a child in 39, and then they got married, say, 1949 or 59. They got, there's a notation. Some, this was before computers, so somebody had to go through all these paper books and make a note that their name had changed to whatever their certain name is now and the date of the marriage. So it's inter very interesting if, you, if you're looking for more recent connections. Scotland's people, if you are interested in Scottish ancestry, <clears throat> is the only place to get most Scottish records. It's free to search. And then to see the actual document, you get you buy it with credits. But as I say, it works out to about $2.65 Canadian for a birth certificate or a marriage certificate, which is really cheap compared to a lot of places. So, and the the indexing is pretty good because it's been government done. Now, <clears throat> it might even be mine. I hope not. Um, <laughs> um, a tip that when you find a record. You, there prob usually is a way to say save to your computer, download to your computer, save a copy to your computer, because you know you you've seen it online and you may think, oh, I I just need to note the date of that. But I was going through some uh, records from my husband's aunt who's passed away, but I have boxes of her genealogical stuff, and she had apparently seen an immigration page for somebody who came in about 1880 to Canada, and she'd made a note, oh, well, I saw that at the time, but I, for, I didn't get a copy of it. And I'm thinking, well, that would have been nice to have the copy with the actual details of when he came. So I always download a copy, and often the, the file name, when you go to save it, it doesn't really mean much to you. It'll just be a bunch of numbers because that's how they've stored their file. So you give it a proper name so that you'll know who it's about and who, when, it, what it is. The other reason for saving it to your computer is that it may somehow get deleted from that database. I've seen that on occasion. Mm -hmm. So. As long as you have it, you have it. If you store it in your folder on your uh, that's part of your um, ancestry account, it will get deleted from there too. So, yeah. So storing it to your own computer is good. And none of these files are big usually. I mean, a JPEG's a couple hundred yeah. bytes or whatever. So you're not going to overwhelm your computer, but you are going to accumulate a library of good information. And I have to put in a plug for the Ontario Genealogical Society. So in 1961, some people thought it would be a good idea to have a society to study genealogy. And they formed around the Waterloo area, and got some members from Toronto, and there's more members came on board, they did thought, well, maybe we'll have branches to meet in geographic areas so 
people can meet in their own area. And there are now 30 branches. There's some special interest groups as well that are not geographic but are people members who like there's a Scottish special interest group there's an Irish special interest group and there, there are several others so um, but we're obviously the Kingston branch is a geographical area now a lot of us are not doing research on relatives who were in the Kingston area because we come from wherever else and also our ancestors came from wherever else but we meet here because that's where we live so we can network with one another and talk to one another and we also have built up a, over the years a library of I don't know how many I met, should have found out how many at least 1500 books and yes yeah, so in the central library branch on Johnson Street on the second floor if you go up to and then turn right there we're the, I guess they sort of call it the history room or something like that most of the shelves are holdings that belong to Kingston branch there's also books provided by the public library too that are history related and there's um, books from the UEL Society too. Uh, so it's a good place to go and just sit and get lost in books and you have to read them there because they're non-circulating but uh, and and they don't they apply to genealogy from all places so just because it's in Kingston don't think that you won't find books about Irish genealogy or uh, American or whatever. Oh, I have a slide about it already. So, yeah, so anybody can go in and use the books anytime the library is open. And right, so and then the OGS website for the, the provincial website has information on all the branches and you may find that you want to um, find out about a great uncle who moved off to Kitchener and you don't know anything about Kitchener but there is a Waterloo branch so you could see what they have on their website or particularly you might want to plug names of people into the Ontario name index which is free and on the front of the <laughs> website. Do you want to talk about our contributions <laughs> to Tony? Uh, so the database is called Tony, the Ontario name index and I think it started off as being you know, sounds like a good idea and we'll add all the people in all the censuses and it's grown and grown. It's over 13 million names now and it's still growing. I don't know if it's growing as fast now as a couple of years ago, but we've um, re-indexed all of our publications and submitted all those names and I, I can't remember how many thousand names we've submitted over the last four or five years, but it's helped to increase the overall for to a great extent. And so in the, when you find that name, it will tell you what publication that name was in and you can contact the branch and either arrange to purchase it uh, or in a lot of cases now you can actually find the, it'll link to the page that that person's name is on and you can pay a dollar for that page instead of buying the whole book. So hopefully over time it'll be an advantage to a lot of people. Just be sure you have the right John Brown before you buy the book. <laughs> <clears throat> and so here's Digital Kingston that I was mentioning earlier. So it has links to early newspapers and also the city directories and 
some family files that the library had collected over the years. So if, for research, I, and I don't know what it would have about Wolf Island families, but they would have turned up in the early newspapers too. So there must be stuff about Wolf Island in it. <clears throat> so yeah, my tips on searching databases. So people, you type in a name and you and it comes up and says there's nobody with that spelling. Well, my my one example, my auntie great grandparents were, were McVitie M C V E T Y, but his brother, who also settled here just in Sydney spelled it M-A-V-E-T-Y. And and of his sons, two spelled Mick and two spelled Ma. And I think it was because they were saying this with an Irish accent, so it was Maviti. And so they didn't quite say the C, some of them. And so, and it didn't, they didn't seem bothered by the fact that they spelled it differently. And then one of my line went off to the States and for some reason he started spelling it as E-T-T-I-E -E. and but I mean they're still brothers even though they spell the name differently so when you're searching for them in a database databases um, often have tell you what wildcard characters you can use so a lot of names for instance Y on, on the end or IE are going to be different but you can so you could put the first few letters of the name and then a, a asterisk, and it'll show you any variant of that spelling. So some sometimes when you're searching, you have to just change the spelling yourself and research again because the the database doesn't allow for a wild card. It all depends. And in the 1921 census on ancestry, your McVitie, some of them are MC space yes. D E T Y. Yes. And I scratched my head trying to look for one of my families, and I knew who they were, where they were, but they I couldn't I couldn't bring them up. So I searched by my aunt's name, Evelyn, and then there was only like 11 Evelyns in that in that county, and then I could find the family, and it was M C space, and the rest of the name. Yeah. So you'll, they may cause you to scratch your head and pull out your hair, but <laughs> there are these vagaries. <clears throat> and because <clears throat> a lot of our ancestors didn't really know how to spell their name because they couldn't write. So somebody else is writing it down. We have a publication that was done years ago by our branch, um, can marriages of Canadians in New York towns, and it goes along sort of from, I think from Watertown to Ogdensburg, yeah. my first, there were several different town records were, were sort of called for anybody that said they were from Canada. <coughs> and because some of them had French names, but they were being written by somebody in New York State who didn't know how to spell a French name. You get some very strange spellings, but if you s sort of say it aloud, then it comes out right. Oh, and I, I thought I had a bunch of these. This is the Francophone presence in Kingston, past and present. And I know there have to have been Francophones on Wolf Island because I know about Bois Vers and Greenwoods. So if anybody wants to just have a look at this um, brochure, I don't even know who did it. I think oh, the Association Canadian Francaise de l'Ontario. Okay. And it's years ago, so I don't know, think they have any. But you can have a look at that after if, if any of you have any French ancestry here that you in, are interested in. But keep in mind that people writing the name might not speak the same language as the person who was saying the name. So <clears throat> that makes also some searches in Quebec are sometimes interesting. 
Oh, there you go. And when you've done a search like that, well, Paul talked about keeping sources, so, so keeping track of them so you didn't go back and search again for the same person and the same source. And uh, keeping a research log is such a good idea. I wish I had done it when I was starting out because I know I have looked for some people two or three times because I didn't track the fact that I'd already gone. Now, on the other hand, some databases get added to as, they, as the company may digitize more records or go to a later date. So sometimes you'll want to go back and search someplace for, see if they've added to it more recently. But yes, my last little tip to myself is to read the parameters first to find out when the database will end. <clears throat> I almost did it the other day again. The BC birth marriage deaths are available online free but only up to a certain date and I had found somebody and found a, something in a newspaper saying he'd gone to BC so I thought oh I'll go look for his death there and then I realized it would have been after the date of, after the date of the cutoff, so it wouldn't do any good. So just a some little spreadsheet or you know just anything to keep track of what you looked for and what the whether the you found it or not, and what book or source you were looking. It can be so helpful, save you a lot of time in the long run. And given names can change. People seem to use nicknames a lot. And so if they have, if they're Mary Ellen, and they did, I have had this one woman, I couldn't find her on the census after she left Kingston. She was Mary Ellen Elizabeth and her mother was Elizabeth and I guess she wanted to be called Elizabeth but couldn't be Elizabeth at home when she was living with her mother. It was a bit confusing. As soon as she was married and off to the west she started using Elizabeth as her name instead of Mary Ellen. So it happens. Be aware of that. And you know Bert could have, could be anything. And maybe he wasn't even Robert or Albert or Herbert. Maybe he was, Bert was just a nickname. So it can be a bit challenging. And Find a Grave is a, and Billion Graves are relatively new sites where people take photos of gravestones so you can it's hard to find death dates for more recent people because of privacy rules. So if you want somebody who died in the 50s, good luck, because they're, they're not going to be, except in BC where they go up to about deaths in 1990, I think. It's quite late. Yeah. yeah, but most places you can't come that recent. But if you want to find where Uncle George died, or if he died, you can go to these sites and put in a name and maybe you won't find that he's dead yet or you won't find that anybody has yet gone into that particular cemetery and taken photographs of the stones and put them on find a grave or billion graves. But there, those sites are really expanding and some people seem to just love to go out and go down a row and take pictures and post them and that's that's very helpful and often now people are adding things like obituaries out of the newspaper or something to the find a grave entry so I, I had this family I would found had gone to Michigan and I finally found the stone on find a grave 
And then for some reason I went back about 10 days later and suddenly it, there was the woman's whole obituary. And I, I even contacted the person who it said had done that to thank her. She said, well, I have nothing to do with my time and we're a small town. So I thought I might as well put all the obituaries onto <laughs> the web for people. And I thought, what a, what a blessing. Because of course, from an obituary, you then get survived by the daughters with their married names and where they're living. I mean, you don't always, but if it's a nice one, you do. And you can expand your family. So we would certainly invite any of you to come to our meetings. Um, lately, well, since 2020, we've been meeting by Zoom. And all you need for that is a phone or a tablet or a computer and the Zoom address. And our, our next meeting is September 21st, and I didn't bring the Zoom instruction, the Zoom link, but you can get it from our branch website. Our October meeting, which is the third Saturday in October, we are going to try hybrid. And so we're going to have, we used to meet in the senior center over on uh, Francis Street. Francis Street. Thank you, Paul. That was a senior moment, <laughs> forgetting the name of the street. And um, so we're going to meet there, and, but we've got the technology worked out so we can also, people can come by to the meeting by Zoom or in person if they want to see people in person. Some people really like to sit next to people and actually chat to them like this. And I've put our information because Paul's in charge of the committee that publishes things like cemetery transcriptions and I think you have a few over there for do, people yeah. to look at. And it, I included in your handout is a list of all the links that I've mentioned, but um, if you'd rather ha ha get it in a file so you don't have to type in the links off the piece of paper, just contact me and I will send you the PDF version and then the, the links are just live. You just click on the link and there you are. You can go to Library and Archives Canada or whatever without typing. D you may have got the impression I'm a lazy typist. <laughs> Keeps it accurate. Yes. <laughs> may I see if you can send me the, um, the PDF version? I'm going to include it in my email blasting. Um, oh, that's a good idea. That yeah. yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. Because... Um, I mean, it's not exactly a copyright list or anything because it's just links to other places, but so, sure. And I think that's all we have to say unless we have more, have questions or, yeah. I did bring a few copies of publications we've done on Wolf Island that are for sale here. There's a list of all our publications too if you want to take a publication list. And the red uh, folder in the middle of the table there is just a, an example of a family that I've done where I've got a tab for each of the individuals and then the, an illustration. You can see the kinds of documentation and, and information that I've put for each of those which starts off with a family group sheet that you've we talked about earlier here. So it's just there for an, an idea of what what can be done? Yes. Yes. For that, for coming to Canada that from eighteen, mm -hmm. go to Library and Archives Canada. <clears throat> In the states, um, they have earlier lists. I think you'd get those for ancestry for people who arrived at American ports. And 
keep in mind that sometimes Canadians came to American ports and then up. Mm -hmm. Because I know of at least two different families that came in probably to New York, I don't know, and then crossed New York State and ended up in Waterloo County. So, <clears throat> of course, Canadian ports tended to be frozen up in the winter. I think there weren't as many ships came to Canadian ports early in the winter, but you could still go to Philadelphia and Baltimore and New York, so. Hmm? Yeah, there's Pier 21 yeah. in Halifax. Yeah. Um, that you might just Google. I was there, and I, I couldn't find my family coming to Canada, and they had transcribed the written name incorrectly huh. for both Yeah, handwriting was bad. Indexing has been <laughs> is bad. Trying to read the handwriting, and sometimes, you know, at, at some point, one of the big census releases, I ancestry contracted it to an Indian company to do the indexing. Well, those people in India are not going to be familiar with any of the names in North America. So, but they do. Well, Ancestry and Family Search, at least, and I think other sites too, let you submit a correction if yeah. you know that that they've got the name wrong. You can submit a correction, and they will. Yes. Over here. Hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot on YouTube. If you go to yeah. YouTube and just type in genealogy, you get a lot. Huh. If you join, like subscribe to her site, she will answer questions for you. And what's her name? Connie Knox. Connie Knox. Huh. huh. It's not one I know. It's not a name I know. So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 And we've been recently been in contact with one of his descendants. And originally, his ancestors were um, Villeneuve, so Ville for town and Neuve for new, new town, Newton. So Moses Newton was <laughs> actually uh, Villeneuve. So there's, there's lots of, uh, of of good stuff like that. So could I could I just ask everybody, please, if you if you have a question. Can you just wait a second? I'll bring the microphone over because I think all of your questions are really important, but we'd like to be able to hear them. <laughs> Come on, I didn't interrupt Sorry. the train of thought. <laughs> I just wanted to make a little comment about you were talking about people who get their first names changed, and, and Brian could probably attest to this, but in the early 50s, a lot of Dutch families moved to Wolf Island. And in some cases, supposedly the, the immigration people changed people's names because they couldn't say the Dutch name. So they assigned them a name that they could say. And so they went on their life with a different name. 
And that there's people on, alive on Wolf Island right now that don't use a Dutch name, they use a different name. Uh, just a little comment, just to say anybody who changed the names there. Another hint like that is in, in uh, baptismal records. If, if, like, I had an aunt, uh, they, they wanted to call her Ruby, but Ruby wasn't a saint's name, so the priest usually added Mary or something like that. So if, if the name that you're familiar with doesn't sound right, then look for a Mary first, or, and, and quite often you'll find them not right. It's all a challenge. And if, if you like doing jigsaw puzzles, it's just like putting together a big jigsaw puzzle eventually. But sometimes it takes a long time to find that missing piece. And sometimes you never will. But you know, I, I don't know if you noticed the shot I had of the, the family group of the great uncle, great aunt and children. On the, pay, on the computer screen. I don't have their marriage. I've looked for 40 years for that marriage, but it predated civil registration of marriages. It was probably an itinerant Methodist minister, and they were up in Huron County, so he didn't turn in his records to anybody, apparently, or his saddlebags got wet, so there, there's I may never find that, but I can assume. But I was saying to Paul on the way here, I have another family, and I'd looked for ages for the marriage because it should have been in the civil Ontario Civil Registration of 1890. I found reference to it in a newspaper. The Hamilton Spectator is online now, so I found the little write-up of, Married Friday night at the family's home, and da 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 da, and the minister was. So I know they actually did get married. I assume that minister forgot to turn in the piece of paper he was supposed to turn in to the government to say he had married them, because it's not in the official registration. Now, that isn't the only thing missing from official registration. John A. MacDonald's death is not in the Ontario registrations. So again, I think somebody, I mean, they, this was the Prime Minister, and this everybody was probably running around like a chicken with their head cut off because this terrible thing had happened, and nobody thought to actually take the piece of paper from the doctor and take it to the courthouse. So it's not officially registered either. So there are gaps. Something I've noticed on um, when I'm looking at other people's uh, trees in that, they've cropped part of a document, like a baptism or a marriage or whatever, they just crop that little wee piece out of the whole page you shouldn't do that. It should be the whole page because you're missing the citation then. You're missing the proof. Well, it, it depends. Sometimes when you get a record from England, they'll take, if you officially buy one through the, the this was from record Wolf office. Island. Okay. Because <laughs> they, they will just photocopy yeah. the portion that applies and put it on a certificate. Yeah. No, th th this was actually from Wolf Island because I have the whole book. Uh. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why did you just crop that? I mean, you need to see the whole page and then have the citation as proof. Yeah, context is important. To, and that's what I say, be careful, just a little cautious about other people's tree information that you see on the line because you don't know. That's what, my last resort. Yeah. <laughs> I and everywhere else for I find that most people, I mean, a lot of them you can contact now through the, the web, but they don't take kindly to being told, I'm sorry, I think you've got the wrong couple having that child because the woman would have been 10. So I think, I think you're finding two pe couples that have similar names and you're using the wrong couple. 
So that's why I like the whole book because then you can flip the pages to see who's before and who's after in that area. Mm -hmm. And then you know you've got the right person. Especially with the census. Yes, because it it's often important to know who lives next door to you or down the road. Because sometimes when the indexing is bad, uh, say you have followed a family through the 1861, 1871, 1881 census, and they're all on the same farm all the time, and they're, the index won't bring them up in the 1891, maybe you could go back and look at the names of the their neighbors and see if the neighbors are still on the next census and maybe it's just poor handwriting or whatever uh, that is preventing you from finding it. Mm -hmm. The, the um, latest Canadian census released is 1931 and apparently my aunt and uncle went off to Mars during the census and never were on it. I have found, I have not found so many people on the 1931 census. I don't know if it's bad indexing, I assume that, but um, they're not, they're not coming up in the index. So that of course then means I have to figure out what area they lived in and go page by page. And I, with a common surname, I haven't felt so inclined. <laughs> One thing I got caught up in is I, uh, on my, gra my great grandparents' uh, wedding uh, certificate in 1930, it had six kids by then. And when I asked my second cousins who are a little older than me about it, I caused the family roar. <laughs> so you've got to be watching who you're telling what. Hey, I've done that. <laughs> and we didn't discuss <coughs> DNA because I think you, you need to, if you're just starting genealogy, you sort of need to get your family organized first. But DNA can be a useful tool. But if you're going to study your DNA, you do have to be prepared for surprises because it, people have been having it done long enough now that there are lots of stories of surprises. And um, there's a was a newsman from the states. Who, uh, I think he's on MSNBC. I'm I'm not sure who wrote a book a few years ago. His cousin got him to do his DNA because his cousin was doing genealogy and then his cousin said I think they must have blown the test because it says we're not related. Do you want to do another test with a different company? And so he did and it still came back saying his cousin was related to his brother but his cousin wasn't related to him. So he went to visit his 85-year-old mother, and she said, Well, I always did wonder. <laughs> she had briefly had an affair with her boss, so he learned who his real father was. So you have to be prepared for surprises. So far, I have not had any. I guess I came from a long line of prim and proper Presbyterians and Methodists who didn't do anything untoward but but I and and the contacts I've made have confirmed all the paper research I've done so far because as soon as I had mine tested and got my results there were two fourth cousins that I'd been corresponding with so that's nice that my paper research was accurate and it proved also to me that the DNA does actually find people you're connected to but it's I think some people get it get their DNA tested thinking they'll suddenly get a whole family tree handed to them and it doesn't work that way what uh, one thing that I did a few years ago which might be helpful to people searching 
Wolf Island families is uh, I went to Queen's Archives several times and I, I made an index of all property transactions for Wolf Island. Uh, the early land records up to the late 1840s were all just front in that county all lumped together but in, in the late 1840s Wolf Island got its own book. It was book A and then it went to book B and book C and so on. So I've got uh, an index of everything up to about 1860 and I've got several uh, notations after that up to the 1880s. And so if, if anybody needs it I can give it to them. I'm sure it'll be useful for people. And now recently within the last year, year and a half, all, all the Ontario land records are on um, FamilySearch.org. Now you you can't just plug in a name and, and they're not indexed like that. But if you know the lot and concession number specifically, you can get to see the images of the land transactions. But <clears throat> we had a lady get in touch with us a couple of years ago from Minnesota. Uh, got in touch with the historical society. They emigrated back in the famine time from Ireland uh, to Minnesota, but her own father, who's gone now, realized there was a 40-year gap where they lived on an island south of Kingston, Wolf's Island, he pronounced it first. Hmm. And uh, Jeanette Walsh then got in touch with us. I'd like to come at Christmas time and spend the time over on Wolf Island and dig more into my ancestors three or four who are buried here, some were born here. Just something their family didn't uh, know. She came, she became a <laughs> permanent resident, like in, in our, <laughs> with our historical society. She's returned since then and is coming back again in October. But the link, Brian found where they lived, uh, up the, I'm going to say, was it the eighth line, Brian, or the seventh? Seventh. And uh, the links, but... Ironically, I want to spend a Christmas like my ancestors did. She caught the last boat around noon coming to Wolf Island, which was just in the throes of one of the worst snowstorms the island has ever seen <laughs> in 40 years. The boat had to tie up. She came, got into the old spoor house down by the water. My bed moved in the night, all of the above, and uh, went to Mass by candlelight, not the same church. But I said, you do know you are the reason this storm hit. <laughs> <laughs> Why Christmas time? And she solved a, a mystery like Sean and I couldn't understand. Why then? Everybody, including Sandy, everyone stopped to see this mysterious lady walking. Are you okay? Are you all right? Well, I'm heading to church. I'm heading to the old cemetery. And I said, you got up into there? That's hard to find now and on a day like today. And she said, Brian, I am from Minnesota. Snow <laughs> means nothing to me. No. But she got off the train dressed more heavily than anyone on the Franklin expedition for me. <laughs> <laughs> With the goggles, the whole bet. And I said, this has got to be her. But <laughs> she loves her Wolf Island roots. And uh, she's now part of it. And she wants to return and spend another week here with us. So, I mean, that was uh, amazing. And really, you know, how she traced everyone found my great aunt, let me see if I can just grab that, uh, uh, Alice Johnson, the, one of the children from the Irish emigration. We have a photo of her through you know, Shays. Alice married a Duffy. Well, she said, Jeanette found this. Patrick, uh, uh, James Duffy married Alice Johnson. His brother, Patrick, married an O'Reilly and emigrated to the Minnesota Trail with her family. She said, they're buried just a mile from my house. Wow. I mean, we could, when she did her talk here, we couldn't believe the link. And there's somebody, a total stranger from Minnesota, would never link up here. We never heard of the Minnesota Trail from Wolf Island. She spelled it out for us, what you had to be, what you had to have before you go to this promise farmland, you know, uh, west of the Great Lakes. And, and, and uh, 
it was it was amazing, just amazing. What and she's doing the second book uh, on her family links. And this lady spent Christmas in Ireland two years previous. I just wanted to see what the family were, what Christmas traditions were in Ireland. Then she learned Wolf Island. Her, her great grandparents were married in St. Mary's Cathedral. We we're kind of on the tail end of COVID. The priest let us in, and they were practicing on the big pipe organ, which would have been there. We were in there for about, I think, half an hour. She was just, just overwhelmed. Just through the Duffy, uh, that we, I don't think we're related, but, but. But on that same Duffy stone in the graveyard. Yes. There's a Johnson, and the Johnson Maybe spelled J-H-O-N, S-O-N. Yeah. Oh, no, th they were, like, the ones that went to Minnesota, uh, uh, through the Duffies. Yeah, but, uh, no, J Jeanette and I are. Okay. I, I got another real funny one. The U.S. did my DNA, because they were trying to find where the first Kenyans came into the United States. And mine came much later, so it wasn't a big deal. But I'd asked them if they had any fun, funny stories about it. And they said, yeah, we had uh, 25 Kenyan, or 25 people connected by DNA and could not find a connection to any of them. And it ended up, some guy was feeding a sperm bank, and that's where all these 25 people were related <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know where these brick walls are. <laughs> I was just going to say that uh, when you're searching in newspapers, there are occasions where there's misprints or typos. Um, and my own, like my great 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 grandfather died on Wolf Island, Donald McDonald, in 1839. And his obituary, which was published in Kingston and in Ottawa, or Bytown, it said he was 97. But we, and so there was a kind of a block there, couldn't connect him with his ancestry because his father was born in 1830 uh, so it would only have been uh, 12 years old when he was born uh -huh. but I think there was a typo 80, uh, 87 years old would have been more reasonable than 97 mm -hmm. and, uh, because we did prove who his father was and, and that now it's all the way back to Summerlet in the 10 hundreds so yeah you there are typos in papers. <laughs> well, pa newspapers still make errors, so. Okay, <laughs> right. I think that's it for today. So um, thank you everyone for coming out. These are great questions. Thank you, Nancy and Paul, for making the trip over today. Um, I think, you know, I see lots of people that were writing stuff down and asking great questions and stuff so this is really really good um and that so uh thank you so much for coming well, thank and thank you mike from aerosnapper kingston for also coming and filming us today and um <clears throat> and that so enjoy the rest of your afternoon please feel free to get a little something on the way out and uh i hope to see you in a few weeks yeah thanks, thanks.